Welcome back, everybody. This is another episode of the Exodus Project. I'm your host, Steve Eisenhower. And once again, I'm joined with my good friend, Rabbi Stuart Federo, straight from the Big H, Houston, Texas. <laughs> uh, he is the author of Judaism and Christianity, a Contrast. Also available in Spanish and soon to be some other languages, if I remember correctly. It's already, it's already in, uh, it already is in Portuguese. Nice. Portuguese, as they say in Hebrew. Portuguese. Nice. You see that it's Judaismo E, but the E is an actual E. Oh, cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Instead of the Y. Neat. That, that shows you it's Portuguese. Cool. So, yes. So, cool. Yep. Well, in the intro to this video, you would have seen that I, too, have recently re released a book, which is also available in Portuguese. Uh, the Christian Coloring Book. Yep. Thanks, Rabbi Federo. Uh, yeah. You read it. What did you think? Oh, I thought it was great. I thought it was great. I, you know, you, you covered the usual uh, Christian misuse of the Hebrew scriptures to prove Christian claims and why they're wrong. So and that was that was the point. It's it's supposed to be point. something you can keep in your pocket. It's yep. only forty pages long. Um, something you can keep in your pocket 40. and well, if you're going front and back, it would be twenty. But well, yeah, okay, that's what I yeah. But uh. uh but yeah, it's just something I, I I chose what I thought were the top seven missionary claims. Um, you know, Isaiah fifty three, Isaiah seven fourteen, uh, Pierce the usual rogue the rogues usual. gallery exactly. And I I I even used the KJV to cite the cite the verses so they couldn't say um, I was trusting a different translation. No, no. Oh, I first of all, every Christian group will say bad things about the King James Version, but then they'll use the King James Version. <laughs> exactly. And every computer program comes with a King James Version for free. Right. So right. everybody's got it. Right. Yep. So yeah, everybody, if if you'd like your own copy, please let me know. I'll be glad to uh, glad to oblige. i um, been getting a lot of good feedback on it. And like I said, it's meant to be just a quick, quick response, quick response resource, the Christian Coloring Book. Christian Coloring, I hope you can see that. Yeah, looks good. All right. But today, Rabbi, we are going to talk about a topic you are very passionate about. Yes, I am. We are going to handle it with that same passion and be very careful and uh, understand that this is basically your brainchild and, and you're going to you're going to guard it as so. Yes. It, look, it's I'm intending to write a book. I've got most of it written. There are certain snags, okay, certain editing that needs to take place. There are materials I need to add, and even that will have to be edited. I'd say it's about 75% done. And the title, okay, is What Are the Jews? And there's a subtitle, but we're not going to talk about the subtitle part tonight, today, now. Uh, but I'll tell you, it's What Are the Jews? And why you should choose to be chosen and choose Judaism, whether or not you are already Jewish. Yes, it's intended to be missionary. <laughs> so that'll put some hackles up on people's necks. Sure. But uh, there's a lot. I, I reserve the right and that everything I say that's in this video is trademarked and copyrighted and set aside and don't don't copy paste <laughs> be nice to me yeah. okay so and if it makes you feel any better rabbi my videos do come with a watermark on the bottom so we can easily uh dispatch good them. thank oh. you so okay so what are the jews let me share my screen okay what are the jews can you see that yes all righty Okay, so what are the Jews? The answer is that the Jews are a nation defined by religion. The Jews are a nation defined by religion. What does that mean? In the Torah, in Genesis chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, we read the following. Now the Eternal said to Abram, get out of your country and from your kindred and from your father's house unto a land that I will show you, and I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you and curse those that curse you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. But I want to point out to you that it says, I will make of you a great 
nation. The verse does not say, I will make of you a great culture. Right. The, the verse does not say, I will make of you a great ethnic group. Sure. It does not say, I will make of you a great family. What it says is, I will make of you a great nation. And we are a nation, a nation defined by our religion, because it's in our religious literature, the Bible, and our God who determines that we are, in fact, a nation. Mm -hmm. Now, in the ancient world, it was very common for an individual nation to have a specific religion that was associated with it. Sure. So, so for example, you know, the Germanic countries had their head god named Woden or Odin. Mm -hmm. Okay. Greece had Zeus. Rome had Jupiter. Now, I'm not an archaeologist. I believe this to be true, but I don't think that there are any temples to Zeus in Rome. And I don't believe there are temples to Jupiter in Greece. The people of Greece identified that god with the name Zeus, while the people of Rome would pray to a, the god named Jupiter. Right. And if a person had to move from Rome to Greece, they didn't continue to pray to Jupiter. They were now in Greece. They just prayed to Zeus. Right. Same thing. If a person grew up praying to Zeus, and for whatever reason they had to move to Rome, they would start praying to Jupiter. In <laughs> other words, the yeah. function of the God is what was important to them, not the specific God they were praying to. Mm -hmm. If I were in Rome and I wanted thunder, rain, whatever, then I would pray to the God, the Roman God who was in charge in that area of the world for whatever it was I needed. Mm -hmm. So if I needed thunder, lightning, whatever, I'd pray to Zeus if I was in Greece. If I needed thunder and lightning, I, I would need the God who was in charge of thunder and lightning in Rome. What that means, and this is very important to understand, is that the nation you lived in determined the religion, the gods that you prayed to. Right. And the local God, there was a basic idea that every God, because there were every group had their gods, their set of gods. Right. Okay. Was in charge of that locale. Sure. And okay. if I can if I can interject for a second, that's why the Roman Empire was so open to basically absorbing other religions and allowing other peoples to practice said religion. And that's why other right. religions couldn't have cared less. That you know the pantheon. What's a pantheon? It means it's it's like the list of acceptable gods. Right, right. So mm -hmm. if you pledged loyalty to Rome, then Rome would put your god in their pantheon, mm -hmm. or Greece would put it in the pantheon, and nobody cared except the Jews. Right. <laughs> because for the Jews, it doesn't matter what nation we live in. There's only one god in the universe. Right. The god who created and rules the universe. So wherever a Jew lived, the only God, the Jewish God, remained the only God. And wherever we went, wherever we go, mm -hmm. God is God and there is no other. So for everybody else in the ancient world, the nation you lived in determined the religion you believed in. But for the Jewish people, okay, the religion we believe in determines the nation we're a part of, namely the Jewish nation, the people right. of Israel. And that's what God described us, uh, that's how God described us in the book of Genesis in the first place. I will make you a great nation. Yep. And by the way, you can see this very clearly in the Bible, in the next quote, the book of Jonah. The book of Jonah reflects the idea that since each nation had its own God, you could flee from that nation's God by going out of that God's jurisdiction, so to speak. <laughs> okay, that's why, why did Jonah flee to Tarshish? Because he was taking himself out of the jurisdiction of the local gods. Right. But since the Jewish idea of God is that God is the creator and God of the universe, you can't flee from the jurisdiction of God. And that was a lesson Jonah had to learn. And take notice of what the sailors asked Jonah when they felt threatened by the by by the storm. 
Mm -hmm. Jonah chapter one, verse six through nine. So the shipmaster came to Jonah and said to him, what do you mean that you sleep? Arise, call upon your God so that God will think upon us that we perish not. And they said everyone to his fellow, come and let us cast lots that we may know for whose cause this evil is upon us. So they cast lots and the lot fell upon Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us, we pray, for what cause this evil is upon us? What is your occupation? Hmm. From where do you come? What is your country? And of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew. I fear the eternal, the God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Well, there's nothing else besides sea and dry land on planet Earth. So when he <laughs> says, yeah. Our my God made the unit, made the world, made the planet, made the made the earth, they realize there's nowhere they can go that that God, our God, the only God, the real God, isn't in control. Sure. Okay. So when the sailors taking Jonah to Tarshish asked Jonah why the storm was happening, they didn't say, you know, who's your God? Okay. They said, what's where are you your, from? where yeah. are you from? What's your occupation? Because a lot of a career, you know, a lot of occupations had their own God. Oh yeah, of course. Of course. Okay. I can think of Hephaestus for blacksmiths. There's yeah. a good example. Okay. So. They asked him, you know, they didn't say, who is your God? They said, what did you do for a living? What, where'd you come from? What country, what people? Because from the perspective of the sailors, these are what determine who his God would be. Mm -hmm. And when he says, my God is the God who, of, who made all of land and sea, he has no limited territory. Right. He's basically saying you can't run. <laughs> you, you can't, can't run, run and hide from my God. You yeah. can't hide, can't run. Jonah's God was the God of all creation. Very brilliant His point. God created everything. Okay. So again, rather than the nation we live in determining the God we believe in, for the Jews, the religion we believe in determine the nation we're a citizen of. Mm. Okay. And by the way, I want to make it very clear here, and I'll do it again later. When I use the word nation, I am not talking about the country called the state of Israel. I am talking about the people of Israel, the people of the nation, okay? Think of the word nation, and I'll say this again too, think of the word nation the way we use it with the Native American Indians. Right. They used to be called tribes. Mm -hmm. I don't think they ever called themselves tribes. I think that's a white man's epithet, okay? They call themselves nation, and I believe that that is the uh, term they prefer. Well, sure. I mean, you cited... You cited the book of Genesis with Abraham, Abram being told that from him would come a great nation. Exactly. And and uh but he Bris Mila, Brit Mila is is we'll you, get to that. But I but I was just getting into if you want to join the Jewish nation that right. as a male, that's and, and keep yeah. that in mind. Okay. Keep that in mind. Okay. We Jews are a nation. And like all nations, every nation has the right. And does, in fact, have their own laws to define citizenship. Mm -hmm. Every nation has the right and has its own laws to define who is a citizen. And every nation has the right to determine how one becomes a citizen if they are not already. That's called naturalization. Mm -hmm. And for the Jewish nation, the process of naturalization is called conversion to the religion of Judaism because we are a nation defined by our religion. Right. right. Makes sense. Logical. Fits every other nation on earth. Every nation has a right to define themselves. Every nation has a right to define their own process of naturalization. So do we. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, all right. If a person wants to become a citizen of a new nation, what does the what is the process of naturalization? What do they study? They study that nation's history. They study right. that nation's laws. Mm -hmm. They study that nation's cherished texts. Okay, they learn to celebrate that nation's holidays. They they uh, learn the variety of cultures that are included in that nation, and that's exactly what you study when you want to convert to become a Jew. 
Sure. We want to become a member of the Jewish nation. When you convert, because conversion to Judaism is the process of naturalization of the Jewish people, the Jewish nation, you study the same kinds of things. And understanding that we are a nation defined by our religion also helps us understand how a person can be born into the nation. A person inherits citizenship rights through either parent, basically in the whole world. Sure. We, I referred to this earlier. Think of nation like you think of Native American nation. We Jews are a nation, and there are Native American nations who define citizenship in that Native American nation through the father, only the father. And there are uh, Native American nations who define citizenship rights as only coming through the mother. For the Jews, citizenship rights are inherited only through the mother. If one's mother is a Jew, one is also accepted as a Jew, assuming that one has not been raised in another religion and has not converted to another religion. Right. Which we sure. touched on in the video previous to this one. Right. Inim. Yeah. Exactly. And we're going to touch on it again because it's important here. Mm -hmm. Okay. I offer four analogies to understand why the Jews are a nation defined by the religion. So pardon my redundancy by saying the same things over and over again more than once or twice. <laughs> okay. Let's take Andy. Andy is born of two U.S. citizens in the United States. Andy moves to Australia. There he remains involved in every U.S. election. He knows every issue for his home city, his home county, his home state, even the issues on the federal level. He writes his congressional leaders. He has turkey on the fourth Thursday in November and celebrates July 4th with fireworks. Even though he lives in Australia, does Andy remain a U.S. citizen? Yes, he remains a U.S. citizen because he's done nothing to give up his citizenship. Right. Similarly, there are those Jews who actively pursue being Jewish, Jews who affiliate, they celebrate the holidays, they celebrate the holy days, they celebrate the life cycle events, and they participate and internalize the distinctive values of Judaism, and they are exemplified in virtually everything they do. Bert. Bert is born in the United States of two U.S. citizens, but Bert moves to Belgium. There, Bert cannot care less about anything of the United States or from the United States. He doesn't support anything of the values of the United States. As long as Bert in Belgium has his job and his food and his TV, he's content. Bert is not concerned about who the president of the United States is or will be. He's unconcerned regarding any of the political social issues of his native country, the United States. He doesn't even realize when the fourth Thursday in November comes and goes. He doesn't think July 4th is significant. Even though Bert lives in Belgium and does nothing to actively be a U.S. citizen or actively express the values of democracy or celebrating U.S. holidays, does Bert remain a U.S. citizen? Yes, he remains a U.S. citizen because he does nothing to lose his U.S. citizenship. Similarly, lucky us. <laughs> there, are, there are Jews who do nothing Jewishly, who don't affiliate with anything Jewish. They don't affiliate with synagogues or Jewish organizations. But they're still Jews because they've done nothing to lose that citizenship right. in the Jewish nation, the Jewish peoplehood. Okay, just as Bert may not care about democracy or any other value that one would associate with being a U.S. citizen, nevertheless, Bert remains a U.S. citizen. A Jew may also not care about Judaism or Jewish law or the observance of Jewish traditions and customs and holidays and holy days, life cycle events, but nevertheless, they remain a Jew. Furthermore, just as Bert may not believe in democracy, even though it's a basic value of the United States ideology, a Jew may not believe in concepts that are basic and foundational to Judaism, even disbelieving in something as vital as the belief in God. Mm. Because we are a nation, you can still be a Jew, even if you don't believe in God. 
that sounds funny to a lot of people, but we're not just a religion. We're also, and we are a nation defined by religion. So even without their religion, we still remain part of the nation. Not believing in something so vital doesn't lose your citizenship, and not believing in something so vital to the Jewish religion also does not lose your citizenship in the Jewish nation. This is why you can be an atheist and remain a Jew. Because we are a nation, just as one does not lose your citizenship in the United States nation, when one does not believe in our nation's ideology and values, one does not stop being a Jew by not believing or practicing Judaism. Mm -hmm. However, just as there are acts that may lose someone their citizenship in a nation, there are also acts that can lose your citizenship in the Jewish nation, the Jewish people, as we will explain eventually. Number three. First, we had Andy. Then we talked about Bert. Now we're talking about Charlie. Charlie is born in the United States of two U.S. citizens, but Charlie moves to China because he hates the United States. There, in China, Charlie does everything Charlie can do to overthrow the United States government. Charlie puts on sackcloth and ashes and goes into mourning every July 4th. He ignores Thanksgiving. In China, he donates money to Al-Qaeda. <laughs> Charlie attempts to smuggle arms to the United States to overthrow it and works to fight against the freedom and liberty for which the United States stands. Even though Charlie lives in China, even though Charlie works to destroy the United States, does Charlie remain a U.S. citizen? Yes, because working to overthrow the U.S. does not constitute grounds to lose your citizenship. Those who oppose the United States and fight to destroy it with violence merely go to jail. Right. It's only if Charlie becomes a citizen of China that would lose Charlie his U.S. citizenship. If a U.S. citizen hates the United States like Charlie and becomes a citizen of China, but still shoots off fireworks on July 4th, still has Turkey on the 4th of, Ju of July, uh, on the 4th Thursday in July, are they still a U.S. citizen? After all, hey, even though they've become a citizen of China, they still love fireworks in Turkey. No, he does not remain a U.S. citizen. Let me give you an example, another one. A Roman Catholic may be a lapsed Catholic, a bad Catholic, if, for example, they use contraception, or if they divorced without an annulment granted by the Roman Catholic Church. But they are and remain Catholic. They're bad Catholics, but they're still Catholic. Right. On the other hand, on the other hand, if a good member of the Roman Catholic Church refuses to use contraception like a good Catholic, but then is baptized as a Southern Baptist and becomes a Southern Baptist, do they remain a Roman Catholic simply because they continue to follow some Catholic customs? No. Similarly, a person who does everything Jewish, like keeping kosher or celebrating Passover or the Sabbath, but was converted to another religion, another faith, is no longer a Jew. Right. Like Charlie, there are those Jews whose actions could be and are detrimental and destructive to Judaism and the Jewish people. But they nevertheless remain Jews because disobeying the laws and traditions of Judaism, or even working against the best interests of the Jewish people, does not in and of itself make you a non-Jew. The only time that Andy, Bert, or Charlie lose their U.S. citizenship is if and when they accept the citizenship of another country, an mm -hmm. act that usually voids their U.S. citizenship. And now look, of course, the United States recognizes dual citizenship with certain other countries, including, by the way, the country known as the state of Israel. But Judaism, the religion that makes us Jews, does not recognize dual citizenship, so to speak, and by that I mean dual religious loyalties at all. Right. The act, the act of accepting another faith removes that person from citizenship in the Jewish nation. In other words, a Jew who accepts the theology of and converts to another religion is no longer a Jew. Now, let me show you this book, and I have practiced this. I hope this works. Would you please give me back the screen? Mm -hmm. Okay. Hope this works. Can you make me the only person on the screen so I'm larger? Let me see here. There you go. 
I switched it to speaker. So when you speak, you'll be. Okay. Little... All right. Fine. Thank you. All right. So I am reading from the Arya Kaplan our anthology book number one, the Arya Kaplan anthology book number one. I am going to page 270. I am reading from the top. This brings us back to our original question. What can a Jew lose by embracing Christianity? The answer is everything. Christianity negates the fundamentals of Jewish faith, and one who accepts it rejects the very essence of Judaism. Even if he continues to keep all the rituals, it is the same as if he abandoned Judaism completely. The Talmud teaches us whoever accepts idolatry denies the entire Torah. Listen carefully. A Jew who accepts Christianity might call himself a Jewish Christian, but he is no longer a Jew. He can no longer be counted as part of a Jewish congregation. A Jew, I'm sorry, a Jew who accepts Christianity might call himself a Jewish Christian or a Jew for Jesus or a Messianic Jew or a Hebrew Christian, but he is no longer a Jew. And remember, this is Arya Kaplan in his book, okay, The Real Messiah. So you can get the book, The Real Messiah, uh, which I thought I had, but I don't have it handy. Okay, you can get that book alone, but you can also get it as part of the Arya Kaplan anthology. And on page 270, okay, it says, a Jew accepts Christianity, might call himself a Jewish Christian, but he is no longer a Jew. Note there the note that references Mishnah Torah by Maimonides, Avodat Kochavim, which means idol worship, worship of the stars. Uh, chapter 2, paragraph 5, mm -hmm. okay? It says the same thing, okay? Uh, okay, a Jew who serves false gods is considered like a Gentile in all regards and is not comparable to a Jew who violated another transgression punishable by being stoned to death, Ahaz. We'll get to Ahaz in a minute. An apostate who worships false gods is considered to be an apostate with regard to the entire Torah. Similarly, Jewish minim, a minim is someone who is no longer, you know, who right. becomes a member of another religion, mm -hmm. are not considered to be Jews with regard to any matter. Okay. By the way, in your, uh, in, in the video, go, uh, go back to the quote from uh, uh, Mishnah Torah, would you please, that you have? Mm-hmm. Okay, so right there, you can type it in directly from Chabad, Chabad.org, slash library, slash article, uh, underline CDO, slash aid, slash 912360, slash Jewish, slash avodot, dash kochavim, dash chapter, dash two, dot htm. Okay, it's right there. You can copy it in. You can see it for yourself. That a, Even on the Chabad website, this is how they translate Maimonides Abu Dat, uh, Mishnah Torah Abu Dat Kochavim, chapter two, paragraph five. Right. A Jew who serves false gods is considered like a Gentile in all regards and is not comparable to a Jew who violated another transgression punishable by being stoned to death. Who is Ahaz? In the Bible, book of uh, Joshua, I believe, Joshua Judges, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, the, the Jews are taking over the promised land. And the, 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 the ex-Hebrew slaves who are now Israelites are commanded by God, don't take loot. Mm -hmm. Ahaz defies God's law and takes loot. And it really brings down, you know, the hammer on, on, the, on, on the Israelites. Oh, correction. That's Achan. Wait. Achan was stoned in the book of Joshua. Ahaz is the father of Hezekiah. No, oh, I didn't. I I changed. I used it. I'm sorry, Steve. What I sent you was an older version. I, I did <laughs> catch that. Ahan, but it, yeah, it's good. Uh, You're good. Ahan, yes. Okay, sorry. Ahaz is a, is a yeah right. Sorry, Ahaz is a king. I do that. I, I'm sorry. 
Okay, but the point is, is that they're talking about the same guy. Right. He's right. thin. Okay, but they don't ever say that he's not really a Jew. Off all p, off off all p. Shechata, a dying who Yisrael, even though a Jew sins, he is still a Jew. Sure. Okay, but that's only talking about a sin, like a person who eats lobster. It's not talking about a person who who joins another religion. Right. There's a difference between right. there's a there's a di yeah, but people don't get this difference. There's a difference between denying aspects of my faith, no matter how important those aspects are. There's a difference between denying an aspect and joining something that is completely other. Of course, of course. Okay, well, that's the difference. Well, an easy way to put this would be, if you're an American, you shoot another American, you are then tried in an American court as an American citizen. Yep. So it's, it's you know, same exact concept, right? Right. So it, by the way, I'm... It, it... <laughs> It, I sent you the non-edited in my edited. I really do have it at Han. Oh, yeah, you're fine. No problem. I hate when I make silly mistakes like that. All right. Uh, blame my old man memory. All right. So, all right. By the way, I can show you responses from other rabbis over the last 2,000 years that agree with Maimonides, Mishnah Torah, Abu Dat Kochavim, chapter 2, paragraph 5, that a Jew converts to another religion is no longer a Jew. Okay, we did, we, we talked about uh, Charlie, we talked about Bert, we talked about Andy. Now, to better understand this idea of what is a Jew, let's talk about Danny. Danny is born in the United States. His father is a U.S. citizen, but Danny's mother was born in Denmark. At the age of, I think it's 17, Danny must choose between Denmark and U.S. citizenship. But Danny cannot choose out of the clear blue sky Brazilian citizenship because he wasn't born there and he's not got no connection to Brazil through his mother or through his father. Right. He cannot inherit citizenship rights to Brazil since neither parent was a citizen of Brazil. So according to international law and U.S. law, we can inherit the rights of citizenship in a country to either the mother or the father. Jewish law, however, citizenship rights in the Jewish nation only come through the mother, while inheritance rights, which are related to what your lineage is, what tribe you're a part of, right. what, you're, what you inherit like possessions, land, mm -hmm. okay? Inheritance rights only come through the father. And you can look it up in, in the book of Numbers, chapter one, and you can see it in verse 2, verse 4, verse 16, and verse 18. Numbers chapter 1, verse 2, verse 4, verse 16, verse 18. Talks about numbering the Jewish people through their fathers. Yep. Some mistranslated as ancestors. It's not the, that's not what it means there. Okay. Uh, all right. Jewishness, which is citizenship rights, the right to call yourself a Jew, comes only through the mother. And you can see this in the Bible. When Ezra and Nehemiah, Nehemiah, when Ezra and ne Nehemiah told the Israelite people coming back to the promised land after the Babylon Babylonian exile that they had to send away their foreign wives, they also told him that they also had to send away the children of the non-Jewish wives. Right. Why? Because the Bible did not see the children of non-Jewish mothers as Jewish. Sure. If they thought the children of a Jewish father was Jewish, they would say, send away the wives only. Mm -hmm. But they said, send away the wives and the children of the non-Jewish wives. Right. Ezra chapter 10, verse 3. Now, therefore, let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and such as are born of them, according to the counsel of my Lord, and of those that tremble at the commandment of our God, and let it be done according to the law. So in the Bible, in the book of Ezra, in the 10th chapter, verse 3, it specifically says that they have to send away their wives and those that are born to them, because neither the wives nor the children of the wives were considered Jewish. Right. Now, I must say, and I will add this, Okay, in the past few decades, 
Only the reform movement of Judaism has accepted the idea that citizenship rights in the Jewish nation can also come through the father. However, and this is true in the reform movement of Judaism, only if the child was raised with specific and exclusively Jewish ceremonies and affiliations. And a lot of people forget to say, that, oh, if a person's father was Jewish, the reform movement accepts them as, no, they have to be exclusively raised Jewishly, and they have to have ceremonies and affiliations to show that they're Jewish. Okay, I'm not saying I agree with the reform movement, but it's not as it's not as simple as some people make it out. In the reform movement, you have to have a Jewish father, but you also have to be raised exclusively, that means only as a Jew with active participation in Jewish life. Jews, even those born only of a Jewish mother, even those who might not follow Jewish laws and traditions, are members of the nation defined by Judaism so long as they have not joined any completely other faith. Hmm which is no different than citizens of the United States who do not exercise their right to vote. They may not do what one is supposed to do as a citizen, but they remain citizens. But if they become citizens of a country with whom the United States does not have dual citizenship, like China, they lose their U.S. citizenship. Right. Just as it is the United States and the laws of the United States that determine who is a U.S. citizen, just as Mexico cannot decide for the United States, who is a U.S. citizen, and the United States cannot decide for Mexico, who's a citizen of Mexico, the Jews, Judaism, Jewish law decide who is a Jew. Right. Ex-Jews who are now Christians do not decide what and who is a Jew. Christians who are wannabe Jews do not decide what and who is a Jew. Messianic, quote-unquote, Jews who are believers in Christian theology but make themselves appear to be Jews, do not decide what and who is a Jew. It is only Judaism and Jewish law that define and determine what is a Jew and who is a Jew. Sure. Unless, of course, Christians want Jews to define who's a Christian. <laughs> do they? I don't think they're going to want to, considering world history, and specifically the history of the Christian treatment of the Jews. I don't think Christians would accept or like who I would classify as a Christian. Oh, well, he's not really a Christian because he doesn't act like one. <laughs> okay. They may want to look up the fallacy of the not a Scotsman. Not a true Scotsman. Right? Not a true Scotsman. Which, Jews, you know, it's it's such a horrible argument when for roughly 1,600 years of church history, you yep. really only had one option for what was a Christian. <laughs> it isn't until the Reformation that you start getting these other options. Right. And the founder of the of the reformation martin luther wasn't exactly kind to the jews no so jews defined for jews who was a jew not christians jews defined for jews who was a jew not ex-jews not pretend jews not wannabe jews what are the jews i must also say we are not a race if you go back 75 years, you might see, even in Jewish publications, references to the Jewish race. Hmm. But we're not a race. Right. The word race has really changed its meaning over the past, I don't know how many decades. Sure. Being Jewish does not mean belonging to a race. It means belonging to a nation, a people defined by our religion. Right. And those people who make up the Jewish people belong to every race, every culture, every community, every ethnic group, every every everything. Mm -hmm. Remember, you cannot convert to become a member of a race. I cannot convert to become Black. Right. I cannot convert to become Asian. But someone who is Black, someone who is Asian, if they convert to Judaism, he or she would still remain still remain Asian or Black, but now, because they converted to Judaism, they'd also be a Jew. Mm -hmm. So you can't define being a Jew based on race. Right. Okay. And let me remind you of something, or not remind you, That's this is not a reminder. I don't care what a DNA test tells you. Right. <laughs> DNA tests only tell you about your ancestry. They don't tell you about you. Sure. 
And if your if your DNA test from any of the number of 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 of, uh, of uh, DNA testing companies, you know, Family Tree DNA, uh, uh, Ancestry.com, uh, uh, you know, there's a lot of them out there. 23andMe, okay. If they came back and said you have, I don't know what percentage of Jews in your ancestry, that does not make you a Jew. Right. And depending on certain characteristics, you still may have to convert to become a recognized as a Jew. But I will tell you one thing about DNA tests. It tells you where to look. Right. It tells you where to investigate to see, because as we've been saying, if your mother was Jewish, you're Jewish. Mm -hmm. And they don't demand of you to convert to Judaism. Although, frankly, I think it'd be a good idea. It's Gerut L'Humra, uh, conversion for the sake of being strict, sure. so nobody can argue with you. Right, right. Okay. And learning your faith. Right? And you don't have to keep learning proving it to everybody. Right. And, and by the way, even if you don't actually go through the rituals, in a case where you find out your mother was actually Jewish, okay, uh, you still may want to take the classes to learn. Yeah, right. You know, introduction to Judaism or conversion classes. And I'd, I'd venture to say every single synagogue will have introduction to Judaism classes, which usually double as the conversion classes. And half the time in, in when my intro to Judaism classes, I had people who were Jewish. They just wanted to learn. Mm -hmm. Okay. Right. The book of Ruth in the Bible is about conversion to Judaism. And Ruth's descendant was King David, who became the greatest king, making Ruth a convert to Judaism, an ancestor of eventually the Messiah himself when he comes. Yep. You got to remember that even in the Bible, okay, people became Jews. Mm -hmm. Some people wrongly believe the word Jew comes from the word for the tribe of Judah. They erroneously believe that since these biblical characters were not from the tribe of Judah, it's actually wrong to call them Jews. First of all, in the book of Esther, in the Bible, Mordechai is a member of the tribe of Benjamin, not from the tribe of Judah, but he is called a Jew in the book of Esther, chapter 2, verse 5. Now, in Shushan the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordechai, the son of Yair, the son of Shemai the son of Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think that's Shimei, but I mean, I've, whatever. The point is, is that he is from the tribe of Benjamin, but he's called a Jew in the book of Esther in the Bible. Right. The book of Esther also speaks of Persians who became Jews and explicitly right. states that these non-Jews became Jews. Yep. Esther chapter 8 Verse 16 and 17, Esther chapter 8, 16 and 17. The Jews had light and gladness and joy and honor, and in every province and in every city, whithersoever the king's commandments and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews, for the fear of the Jews fell upon them. Mm -hmm. Many of the people of the land became Jews. These people were never Jews. They had nobody in their background who was Jewish, who were part of the 12 tribes of Israel. Yet, the Bible in the book of Esther, chapter 8, 17, explicitly calls them Jews. By the way, the Talmud has a discussion. The Jews who, who converted only out of fear, were they considered real Jews? Yes, they were. Okay. The Bible calls people who are not from the tribe of Judah Jews and calls those who converted to Judaism Jews. We don't know how they're converted. We don't know their ritual. We don't know what they had to do, what hoops they had to jump through, but the Bible still calls them Jews. So the word Jew is the name given to the same people described in the Bible who were also once called Hebrews, also once called Israelites, also called the people of Israel, also called the children of Israel, and they're also called Jews in the Bible from every one of the tribes of Israel. Yep. If you take a look at 2 Chronicles chapter 15, verse 19, if you take a look at 2 Chronicles, the Bible itself tells us that members of every single tribe of the people of Israel were a part of the southern kingdom of Judah. 
Yep. Second Chronicles 15, 9. And he gathered all of Judah and Benjamin and the strangers with them out of Ephraim and Manasseh and out of Simon, for they fell to him out of Israel in abundance. That's the northern kingdom of Israel. When they saw that the eternal was his God was with him. Second Chronicles chapter 11, verse 3. Speak unto Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel in Judah and Benjamin. What does that mean? That means the 12 tribes, I'm sorry, it means the 10 tribes who were in the northern kingdom were also found among the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the southern kingdom. Right. Look at 2 Chronicles chapter 11, 16 to 17. And after them, out of all the tribes of Israel, such as set their hearts to seek the eternal God of Israel, came to Jerusalem in the southern kingdom, to mm -hmm. sacrifice unto the eternal God of their fathers. So they strengthened the kingdom of Judah and made Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, strong three years. For three years they walked in the way of David and Solomon. Note that in these verses, it states all Israel, or all the tribes of Israel, which means people from each and every tribe of the 12 tribes of Israel were in Judah. So when the Jews of the southern kingdom of Judah were exiled to Babylonia, that included members of every tribe, and the word Jew, derived from the southern kingdom of Judah, was used to describe them regardless of the tribe into which they were born. Okay, it's like the word American. Mm -hmm. American means somebody who's a citizen of the United States, loosely that's what it means. Should mean Canada and Mexico as well, you know, anything above the uh, equator. But we use it colloquially to mean anybody who's a citizen of the United States. Doesn't matter what their tribe was, doesn't matter their nation, their culture, their ethnic group. All of that is still included in the term American. Jew is the same kind of thing. Okay. Let's see. When the Jews of the southern kingdom of Judah were exiled into Babylonia, and that included members of every tribe, the word Jew began to be used to describe them regardless of the tribe into which they were born. You can see this, by the way, in the Christian New Testament as well. When the authors of their New Testament speak of the Jews, do you think the New Testament is only referring to those from the tribe of Judah? When the New Testament speaks of Jesus being the king of the Jews, you think that means... Right. That he's only the king of the tribe of Judah? Okay, example, Matthew 2, verse 2, Matthew 27, verse 11. Did it mean Jesus was the king only of the members of the one tribe of Judah when they said king of the Jews? When Paul wrote in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, and Romans chapter 2, verse 10, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, mm -hmm. does that mean... Does that mean that Paul was saying that Christians should only missionize those from one tribe of Judah? All right. Okay. You think when they knock, when missionaries knock on your door and they say, are you Jewish? Yes. Oh, oh we can only talk to you if you're going to be from the tribe of Judah. You think that's what happens? So the <laughs> New Testament is also using the term Jew to mean everybody from any tribe of the 12 tribes of the people of Israel and all those who converted to the religion of the Jews, who became Jews by doing that conversion. The term Jew is derived from the southern kingdom of Judah, not from the tribe of Judah. As I said, it's like the word American. It refers to citizens of a single nation, but includes people from all sorts of national, cultural, and tribal backgrounds. And the word Jew represents the southern kingdom of Judah that included all people from all tribes of the tri 12 tribes of Israel. Yep. So who are the Jewish people? What is a Jew? What are the Jews? We are a nation defined by our religion. And it's clear even in the biblical passages. That's it. That's it. That's all I know of, unless I forgot quotations. Oh, very important. I'm glad you put that up there. See, I already forgot. Okay, <laughs> let, 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 let me, yeah, see how quick. Okay. All right. Um, okay. 
in the modern world, there are people who will misrepresent what the Jews are. Sure. Okay. They will, there are many things that people will say to explain what a Jew, what the Jews are, but their definitions of a Jew may be inaccurate. Right. They may create more problems than they solve. And more likely, the, the word they're using to describe the Jews are not really definitions. They're really more like an analogy. Mm -hmm. So, for example, I've heard people say, well, the Jews are a family. And that may be a wonderful analogy to what it means to be a Jew, but it's not a definition. Sure. And maybe a few thousand years ago, we may have started out as the descendants of a single family, Abraham and Sarah. Okay. But the idea that the Jews are a family is not accurate. And that we are not a family is proven in the story of Abraham and Sarah itself. So in the Bible, in Genesis, it states, Genesis 12, 5, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had made, that mm Hanefesh -hmm. Asher Asu, in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and the land of Canaan they came. What does it mean, the souls that they had made? Human beings can't make a soul. Only God can make a soul. Sure. Maybe it means children, except that Abraham and Sarah didn't, didn't have, have children <laughs> until Isaac and Ishmael. Sure. Which is chapters later. Judaism commentaries understand the souls they had made to mean the converts to the one true God they had made in the city they lived in, who came with them when they left Ur of Chaldees. Right. when they left to go into Canaan, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, does that mean that these people became a part of Abraham and Sarah's family? No. No. It means, remember, later Abraham complains to God that they had no descendants in Genesis 15. So all the people, the, the souls they had made, those that had converted to the one God of Abraham and Sarah, okay, weren't considered his children or part right. of his family right he was okay. under the assumption that his servant was going to have to inherit him and exactly but his servant wasn't a jew it was a kanani yeah right right so when he is pleading to god for a child he calls eliezer his servant his only heir eliezer was not a member of abraham's family he was a member of Abraham's household. Right. Okay. Family, you know, you can usually loosely define family as those we come to hold in deep friendship. Okay. One who is as close to us emotionally as one who is a blood relation. But to be a true family member, you have to have a bloodline descendant of an ancestor in common with others in that family. Yeah. Now, one could marry into a family. But you can also divorce out of a family. Right. <laughs> okay. People forget that. I mean, it's, it sounds like a beautiful analogy, but it's not a definition. Sure. Okay. Members of the family may continue to feel close to the person, the ex-wife of their brother, let's say, the ex-sister-in-law, but that person is no longer family as it's defined. This can serve as an analogy to what is a Jew. It may indicate that the Jews are like a family. But right. family is not the definition of a Jew because we are so much more and the definition to, and, the, and using family as a definition doesn't cover all the circumstances. Okay, I can become a member of a family with no formal act on my part. If I have a brother and my brother marries someone, I become family to his new bride because I now become her brother-in-law. Right. To become a Jew, a member of the Jewish people, a citizen of the Jewish nation, again, I'm not talking about the state of Israel, you have to convert to the religion of Judaism, and conversion is an overt act. Another way that some define a Jew is to say that we are a culture. Well, the Jewish, they'll talk about the Jewish culture. Oh, I love the Jewish culture. Really? <laughs> Merriam-Webster, go to merriam-webster.com defines culture as the customary beliefs, social forms, material traits of a racial, religious, or social group, the characteristic features of everyday existence, 
such as diversions or a way of life shared by people in a place of or time, the set of shared attitudes, values, goals, and practices that characterizes an institution or organization, and the set of conventions or social practices associated with a particular field, activity, or societal characteristic. The definition of culture describes beliefs, material traits, features, attitudes, values, goals, and practices of a particular group, but it's not a description or definition of the people within that group. Sure. A Jew is a person. A Jew is not an idea or an action or a feature or trait, attitude, value. And a person, one person can choose to start believing as a Jew, holding the attitudes, values, goals, practices of the Jews, the cultural stuff, but that does not make them a Jew. Right. No differently than one who knows and performs all the practices, follows the laws, the beliefs of the people of England, <laughs> does not does not be it doesn't make that person English. Right. <laughs> or does it make that person a citizen of England just because they know and perform all the practices, laws, and beliefs of the people of England? Right. Okay. If a person moved to England and became a citizen of England, would the English law, not the people, but the law call them English? Or would English law only call them a citizen of England? Hmm. Because that's how England defines for itself through English law what it means and what is required to be a citizen of England. In the United States, however, if a person moves to the United States and becomes a citizen of the United States, United States law defines that person as fully a U.S. citizen, fully an American. Right. And, you know, in world history, that's not the norm. That's rather exceptional. Mm -hmm. But that is how United States law defines it for the United States for her own citizens. It's also how Judaism defines it for the Jewish people. A person who converts to the religion of Judaism becomes fully, completely, totally a Jew and is no different than one born into Judaism born as a Jew. Again, this is because the Jews are a nation defined by their religion and the act of conversion to Judaism is the process of naturalization to become a Jew, fully a Jew, no differently than somebody born a Jew who does not need naturalization. Right. Another problem that comes with describing the Jews as a culture. Oh, I love the Jewish culture. Really? Which Jewish culture? <laughs> you think the culture of a Jew from Morocco? Is the same culture as a Jew from Germany? Of course not. Is the culture of a Jew from Yemen the same culture as a Jew from India or Spain? No. Would the Jews on the north of Africa in Morocco truly understand Jewish life in a shtetl of Western Europe, Western Russia, or the Ukraine, like you see in Fiddler on the Roof? Could a Jew from India relate to the Italian Jewish culture? Evident in the movie, it's a great movie called The Garden of the Finzi Contini. Hmm. Or, I'm sorry, Finzi Contini, I think it's pronounced. Right. Okay. Their well, religion may be the same. I was about to ask, if I can ask you one question in regards to that, they may have different culture. Right. Have the same Torah, Rabbi? Same Torah, same religion. The culture may influence how they express it. Okay. So, for example, the Jews of the Middle East may think of hummus as a Israeli food, but how they make hummus might be totally different from, you know, the Jews of Greece. Right. There'll be inf cultural influences. Okay. Everybody will have matzah, unleavened bread, but well, matzah may not be a good example. Um, uh, Hiroset for Passover, billion different recipes. So the cu local culture will influence how they make the chorosit mm -hmm. for Passover, okay? But they still have chorosit, don't they? Right. They are all Jews because their Jewish theology, their Jewish belief system, their Judaism is the same. Mm. Jews are not at all able to be defined as members of a single culture because Jews are found in every single culture that exists throughout the entirety of the planet. Their local culture may influence the expression of their religion, but the religion, the religion of Judaism, really is the same. Right. There are those who also will say things like, oh, we can't define what's a Jew because Jews vary so much one to the other. 
And there are so many ways to express your Jewishness. Well, there are many ways to express Jewishness, but the expression of Jewishness does not define what is a Jew. Mm. It's also true, for example, of strength. I can show, I can express my strength, but my showing my strength or expressing my strength doesn't define what strength is. Sure. I can show my Jewishness, I can express my Jewishness, but the showing and the expressing doesn't define what is a Jew, just like showing my strength or expressing my strength doesn't define what is strength. Hmm. We Jews are a nation. We're a nation defined by our religion. And that is what God said that God would make us into all the way back in Genesis chapter 12. Beautiful. Remember, this is copyrighted and trademarked and <laughs> yeah. everything you can say. I hope people learn from it. I hope people spread it around. But eventually I want to make it into a book and it's mine. Yeah, <laughs> well, yeah definitely think you should, Rabbi. Definitely. Oh, that's, I think so too. That's I, great. And that will, you know, that will it's, definitely it's, get rid of some preconceived notions here that I think a lot of people uh, have just so wrong they they talk about this ethno well we're an ethno religion jews are an ethno well ethno religion means a religion that's based on ethnos jews are not a religion we have a religion we believe in a religion we are part of religion but we're a nation defined by that religion so the word ethno religion like 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 tablecloth mm -hmm. okay a tablecloth is a cloth, second syllable, tablecloth, I'm sorry, third syllable, tablecloth. Cloth is what it is. It's sure. used for a table, but the last word in the conjunction of words mm -hmm. is the operative term. Ethno-religion is talking about a religion based on an ethnic ethnicity. Okay, they'll say Jews are an ethno-religion. No, that means Jews are a religion? No, Jews are an ethnos in the original sense, which means nation. We're a nation defined by the religion. So a religio ethnos. You got to be careful. <laughs> you, you, gotta, you got to use words carefully, and people mm -hmm. really get sloppy. Sure, definitely. So I, I hope this will help, and I, I hope it'll help people understand what it means to be a Jew. Yeah, that's great. It's right. really great, and it's when, sets... when I write this into a book. I am continuing the second part of that book to include a section on why people should convert to Judaism if they're not Jews and why they should become more committed to Jewish tradition and law and halakha and mitzvot if they are already Jews. It's, it's missionary. It's conversionary. Sure. So that'll be a little bit, you know, controversial. <laughs> right. Yep. That part is, I mean, that part aside, no Jew could no Jew would be able to say they wouldn't benefit from wanting to get closer to Hashem and, you know, really right exactly have a higher value of their Jewishness. See, but I, I don't want to get into it now. But you know, God needs Jews. God needs us to be committed to the commandments, the mitzvot that God commanded us in the Bible, in the Torah. And why, what do you mean God needs? How can you say God needs? God doesn't need anything. <laughs> well, actually, yeah, kind of God does need. What does God need? I, look, Steve, I don't understand them. I, it doesn't make sense to me. I don't get it. But there are people in the world who are atheists. Okay, fine. They don't believe in God. I don't understand it, but they don't. They don't have to believe in God but they better believe in Stuart Federer who puts my nose an inch in front of theirs and says, stop doing what you're doing. You're wrong and you're immoral. It's wrong to do what you're doing. Sure. Okay. So God needs human beings to teach other human beings about God. Of course. Now you understand the raison d'etre of the Jewish people and why God needs Jews and why God needs people, why God needs people to become Jews. God needs the Jews. Right. We are chosen with a specific task. We are the chosen people. What's that task? To tell the rest of the world that God exists and God demands morality and ethics from God's creation, all of God's creation. Right. And the Jews are the ones tasked with it. Yep. We are the servants of God. And that servant ser servitude mm -hmm. is that we become God's 
advertising agent. As witnesses. <laughs> we are the wit exactly. Your living testimony. You the are witnesses, my witnesses, say the eternal and my, my servant whom I've chosen. Exactly. And what are we a witness to? That God exists and God demands morality and ethics from God's creatures. Yep. Okay. <laughs> Meaning human beings. And yep. nobody likes to be told you know, that what you're doing is immoral, that God wants better behavior. Nobody likes that. Now you know one source for anti-Semitism. Sure. When the I Jews bet. do their jobs. Yep. Now, and please, it's this is all still part of the copyrighted trademark. <laughs> uh, whatever, what other word is there? Copyrighted trademark, you name it. Uh, 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 Stuart Federo coming book. You're right, right. Okay, and I, I expand on that enormously. And even with that, and even with what we just talked about, it's still a very short book. So I, I want to at least give it a little bit more flesh. Sure. But hey, it's brilliant stuff. It's brilliant content. Beautiful. I hope so. And I really think people stand to benefit from that, Jew and Gentile alike. So, um... And I think Judaism and through the Jews, the entire world benefits when there are more Jews. Of course. Of course. So I'm telling you, consider conversion beautiful okay any uh any final remarks rabbi oh that's really it okay well like i said at the beginning rabbi stuart federo the author of judaism and christianity a contrast like we said available in spanish and now portuguese um, and who who is doing this with the christian coloring book <laughs> by steve eisenhower yeah so uh please check those works out um his book many pages exactly just a little over 200 pages so i mean you i i do believe i finished your book in two days so it's uh, really, really great it's readable it's understandable also known in uh portuguese portuguese <laughs> i don't know if you can see that yep Okay. All right. And also in Spanish. Mm -hmm. Can't see that. Okay. You can see it. Yep. All right. At any rate. What's yeah. great about it is you break it down into into language we can all understand. It's not the it's not the you know liturgical religious joke. And, and it's, it's it's not it is not what most people do, sit there and fight over. Well, this verse means that. No, it means this. No, it means that. Stalemate. Mine takes the basic elemental foundational beliefs right. of Christianity and shows Contrast. that they are unbiblical. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and it's a brilliant approach. Brilliant book. Well, um, thank you. So is yours, Steve. Oh, thanks. Short that. to the point, cleverly written. I love it. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. No, seriously. But we are actually, we are less than 20 away from 2,000 subscribers. So if cool. we can get to that 2,000 point, I'm going to do another giveaway. But um, yeah, so please check the description. I have, I'll have to put the Portuguese one on there. But all the all the language options linked in the description, just click and follow that. And also Hebrew Jumpstart, if you just want to take a minute, talk about that. Okay, if you go to YouTube... And you do a search on YouTube for Hebrew Jump Start, you will find a one hour video that William Hall created from a program I do, uh, which is an animated learn how to read Hebrew in three hours. I'm sorry, learn how to read Hebrew in one hour, Hebrew Jump Start. And we go through all of the characters, all of the vowels, all, all of the consonants, and all of the vowels and all the combinations in one hour and if you feel rusty at the end of the hour you can replay part or all of the whole hour sure <laughs> so uh but you really do learn to read hebrew in one hour i used to do it at, at every year for yom limud houston has this wonderful program called day of learning yom limud and i used to teach a three-hour version of this hebrew jumpstart learn how to read hebrew in three hours but i realized that the first hour is exactly what i do the second hour hmm. And the third hour, we're taking the book of Esther and we're reading it in the original, re reading it out loud, sounding out, sounding out the consonants and vowels. So really, it's all one hour. And so, yeah. you know, we made it and he made it into an animation. And uh, 
You can also get it if you go to HebrewJumpStart.com. HebrewJumpStart.com. Right. So. And one more plug, WhatJewsBelieve.com. Check that out. WhatJewsBelieve.com. Um, dot org. WhatJewsBelieve.org. Dot org. Right, yeah. Uh, which is also CreencyJudia.org in Spanish. Yep. And uh, and your book is in Portuguese, you said. Yeah, it was it was That's very cool. Just recently translated into Portuguese. Yep. So both of those are available also. If you're a Portuguese or a Brazilian viewer, please check that out. Um and as always, totally free. I, I give all my content, uh my books, my uh slides, whatever. I, I yeah. offer them all completely totally free. But if you do feel so inclined to donate. You know, this stuff isn't, it takes a lot of time, a lot of work. Yep. My my Hebrew jumpstart is the same thing. It's on YouTube. You can watch it a million times for nothing. Mm -hmm. But if your heart moves you, you can also donate through the, what? I'm sorry, through the HebrewJumpstart.com website. Right. So, yeah, everybody, uh, we appreciate you guys watching. We love you guys. We're always here for you guys. If you have any questions, you know, find Rabbi or I on Facebook, email uh, however, yep. we're glad to answer your questions. Yep. Hebrew jumpstart at hotmail.com. I'm sorry. Sorry. Hebrew jumpstart at gmail.com. And rediscovering God 22 at gmail.com. If you want to shoot me an email, I can honestly say, and I've, I've said this on multiple, I was just on Annie Hunt's show. She interviewed me recently. I did that too, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Well, I listened to it. It was very good. Thank uh, you. But, she, but she was asking me about when I was coming out of Christianity and I was saying just about you know, my feelings and how I was broken. And mm. we got into, you know, how I got over that. And I must say, I name dropped Rabbi Stuart Federo. <laughs> and I said, you know, just having having that shoulder to lean on and really someone to talk to, to wipe my mind clean of that Christian. Right. That I mean, I, I can remember the conversation as if it was yesterday of you telling me, don't carry that shame with you, dude. It's not your fault. You know, and, and, and we are made in the image of God, little lower than the angels. Right. Why Christians, you know, I'm a, I'm a broken person. It's a broken world. Everything is broken, broken, broken. It drives me crazy. And and just having that, having that person to talk to and really work me out of that is what really drove me to just hunker down, study, do whatever it took to eventually get to where we're at now, start the Exodus project and share this same message. So Rabbi Stuart Fredo, I just want to say from the bottom well, of my heart, thank you well, so much. You are kind to say that. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. You know, the Christianity gives people a illness, convinces them they have an illness they do not have, and then tells them that they're the only ones with the uh, cure for that illness. Yeah. You're a sinner. You're terrible. You can't change it yourself. You're incapable. It's part of you. You inherited it, you know, from birth, yada, yada, yada. But we have Jesus. <laughs> Snake oil salesman. Yeah. And then Deuteronomy 30 rolls around and says, I lay before you life and death, good and evil. Choose Therefore, good to live. So. Right. Choose life. Yeah. Choose life. Yep. Exactly. Yep. Okay. But all right, everybody. Until next time, I'm Steve Eisenhower. This I'm Stuart Pedro. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <Stuart> <laughs> I'll see you next time, everybody. <laughs>